Hi everyone and thank you for those who just joined and those who are still joining. I thought I'd just kick off um, as we've got a few people already in. So hi everyone and welcome to Babylon's Mental Health Awareness Webinar. Um, firstly, thank you to everyone who has joined us here today. My name is Stina and I'll be hosting today's event. But before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded. So for those of you who may need to jump off at any time or if you miss certain details, the good news is that we are recording and we can share a link with you afterwards. So if you would like to watch again, please feel free to reach out to events at babylonhealth.com and we will send you this recording. Now, to give you a bit of background about Babylon, Babylon is a global healthcare company that has a mission to put accessible and affordable healthcare in the hands of every person on earth. We believe that helping people to live their happiest and healthiest lives is an important step to making that vision a reality. And that's why for Mental Health Awareness Month and Week, we want to bring our experts together to be part of the fight for mental health, both here in the UK and the US. So in honor of mental health awareness, Today, we will be discussing anxiety post the pandemic and dealing with grief and how to build resilience and the lessons that we have learned from quarantine when it comes to our mental health. Now, before I introduce you to our lovely panelists, I would just like to point out that this event is of course live. So please do bear with us if there are any technical issues. And if you don't mind turning off your cameras and your microphones, that would be great. Um, and for those of you who do have a question, as you can see on the slide here, you can scan the QR code where you can submit your questions anonymously. So without further ado, please let me introduce you to our panelists. So first up, we have Dr. Keith Grimes. Dr. Keith, can you please give us a wave? Good afternoon and morning, everyone. <laughs> Dr. Keith is a director of clinical innovation at Babylon and an NHS GP with nearly 20 years of experience on the front line of primary care and the founder of VR Doctors, an online forum supporting the immersive health tech community. A keen advocate of the power of technology to deliver quality improvement globally, he has delivered award-winning digital medicine projects as well as pioneering work in clinical VR and AI. Having been personally affected by burnout and depression, he's a strong believer in the importance of increasing, uh, sorry, increasing awareness, maintaining wellness, and innovating our systems of working as ways of reducing the toll of moral injustice, moral injury, sorry, in the workplace. Uh, next up, we have Kendall Roach. Kendall, can you give us a wave, please? Hello. Roach, the MA LPC is the value based care B360 behavioral health therapist. Now, that is some title for Missouri US. Kendall provides care to all ages and varieties of behavioral health needs. And prior to Babylon, she owned and managed a mental health clinic, worked with two branches of the military and provided school therapy and online therapy in multiple countries. She was also a writer and editor for two magazines and Kendall has felt the effects of the pandemic personally as a mum of three and working with patients. She believes we have all experienced trauma, loss and significant change in some way during this time. However, she feels it has increased, it has increased access to mental health care and revolutionized healthcare as a whole. And she urges her patients to hunt the good stuff every day. And last but not least, Daniel Day. Can you give us a wave please, Danielle? Hello. Danielle, the LPC, is the Behavioral Health Clinical Lead from Missouri, US, specializing in adolescent and adult therapy. Having been a mental health provider for the last 15 years, she has worked in community mental health, neuropsychology, and private practice, treating adults and teens with anxiety, depression, chronic pain, and phase of life issues, such as death, divorce, and job loss. She also has a long career teaching psychology in both undergraduate and graduate programs. Danielle is passionate about helping her clients construct solutions and be able to author new stories in their lives. So we have an amazing panelist today. But before we speak with them, I would just like to share a video with you. And here are some words from Anne Mon Johnson, the CEO of the American Telemedicine Association, which is a close partner of Babylon's. The ATA aims to accelerate the adoption of telehealth and change the way the world thinks about healthcare. And Anne will speak to how virtual care has expanded much needed access to health to mental health resources, especially during our time of need throughout the pandemic. I'm Ann Mon Johnson, the CEO of the American Telemedicine Association, and I'm pleased to be here today on behalf of Babylon and in recognition of Mental Health Awareness Month. Telehealth played a critical role during the pandemic. It allowed millions of Americans to receive quality care where and when they needed it without having to travel to the doctor's office or hospital for treatment or diagnosis 
and which would have put them at high risk for exposure. Even under the most extraordinary circumstances of the COVID-19 public health emergency, telehealth services have proven to consistently deliver high quality, safe and effective care to rural and underserved communities and to our most vulnerable patients. It has been a lifesaver for people unable to access in-person care. Access to telehealth is no longer an option in today's society. It is an essential component of care delivery. It's no surprise that the pandemic has had a major impact on people's mental health, young and old. As a result, we have experienced a significant uptick in the use of telehealth and mental health care, and the trend is continuing. According to Medicare data, mental health conditions were the number one telehealth diagnosis nationally and in every region of the country. And according to the latest numbers, as of February 2021, 54% of telehealth claims were related to mental health conditions. It's important to remember that prior to the pandemic, one out of five Americans had mental health issues and yet 75% of counties in the US had no mental health services. This is why telehealth has become so important now more than ever. And there's now much data showing that both patients and healthcare providers have embraced telehealth and want to continue to receive and deliver care virtually. According to a recent GoodRx study, many respondents who use telehealth for depression and anxiety felt that it was comparable to traditional in-person care. The ATA is working to ensure that the waivers put in place during COVID to allow greater access to telehealth will remain in place permanently once the pandemic ends. We must not allow our patients in need of care to fall off the telehealth cliff. Services offered by Babylon and other healthcare providers are essential to so many. We remain grateful and humbled by the work you do and your commitment to quality care for your patients. So to kick off our panel, I would like to start with the post-anxiety. Some of us may have felt now lockdown is now lifting and the fact we've all been in quarantine for over a year. Um, so I'd just like to come to Kendall on this first. Kendall, why is it that so many people are feeling anxious to return back to normal? Well, the short answer is change is hard and scary. Um, to expound on that a little bit more, when the pandemic hit, we were very unprepared for it. Everything changed and it changed quickly. Um, some of us have been working from home for a year now and, and everything closed, movie theaters, restaurants, music venues, sporting events, schools, businesses, even churches have closed. And you hear the, the term, the new normal a lot. Well, the new normal was being confined from other people and finding a new routine within our boundaries and trying our best to still be safe and healthy. In January, I was working for a large school district after being home for six months, um, only getting out of my house to take hikes with my kids or to go to the market. And returning back to a large school, I had quite a bit of anxiety. Um, but for the students that I worked with that already had anxiety and depression, it was even harder for them. I would come into work and I would find students already in my office having a full panic attack just from walking into their school. So not only are we concerned about the unknowns of COVID and our health and our wellness, but we just got used to this new normal and now we're changing again and we have to find yet another new normal. It won't be our old normal. It won't be what we've gotten used to, but it's gonna be something entirely new. So speaking of normal, it's normal to feel anxious about change. Yeah, yeah, good to know. And Danielle, let's talk about the feeling of guilt during the pandemic. What have you been seeing amongst some of your patients? Oh gosh, yeah. The pandemic has just been a breeding ground for guilt and shame. Um, and I want to nuance that a little bit. If you think about guilt being, I feel bad about something, an action, something I should have done or shouldn't have done, whereas shame is more feeling bad about myself. I mean, we can see that evidenced throughout this pandemic. You know, it's an extremely complex situation and there was no rule book. So I think a lot of us just came out of it thinking, I don't know what I was supposed to do, but I'm pretty sure I did it wrong. And, you know, to illustrate that, think about kind of the two groups that we had in quarantine and more than two, but just as an example, 
there were people who really kind of enjoyed lockdown, right? I mean, it's like time for your hobbies and time away from commuting and stress. And you're just like at home, living your best life, baking the world's greatest sourdough. And yet there's all of this tragedy around you. And so you think, gosh, I must be a terrible person, right? That shame that I'm enjoying this time. And then you have the group that did not enjoy lockdown at all and they weren't coping well. You know, you're eating lunch four times a day and drinking way too many adult beverages. And you know, you come out of quarantine and your clothes don't fit and your marriage is a mess and your kids are behind in school. And you just think, gosh, I didn't handle it like everyone else did. You know, I wasn't coping well at all. And what does it say about me that I struggled so much during that time? And then you can go even further now that we're coming out of COVID to almost this sense of survivor guilt about why am I still here or why didn't I get sick or why didn't I lose a loved one? And as we approach coming back into you know, society, you're gonna interact with people who did experience sickness and who did experience loss. And that's gonna highlight that even further. So again, because it's so complex, because there was just no rule book on what to do, I think most of us just thought, I'm not sure what I was supposed to do, but I'm pretty sure I did the wrong thing. Yeah, no, that makes absolute sense. And Kendall, as I read out your bio, you mentioned that you urge patients to always hunt the good stuff every day. Can you just give us some suggestions what people can actually do every day to improve their mental health or for those who are just struggling to wrap their heads around the last year? Yeah, let me let me tell you how I kind of came to that. Um, <clears throat> during the pandemic, I saw a lot of patients who were struggling with the bigger picture. They were looking at things on a global level, not just a pandemic, but political unrest, civil unrest, and, and all the things like Danielle just mentioned that they were dealing with on their own time as well. And it was just overwhelming in them. And I was seeing depression, I was seeing anxiety. And so I urged all of my patients and even my friends just to focus on the small picture and stop looking at the global picture. I even said like, stop watching the news. Um, and those things are the things that are really important to them. The basic truths in their life, their family, their jobs, their, um, their beliefs, their health, their wellness, their happiness. And um, during this time, one of the great videos that surfaced on the internet was of a guy who you just watched kind of slip into depression during his quarantine. And he came across a video while he was surfing the internet. And it was of a guy in the military who said, get up every morning and make your bed. Just start by making your bed. And then after you make your bed, um, work out and then take a shower and then make breakfast. And just having a routine will help you stay focused and be productive. So you watch the guy do this and eventually he was getting up and he was he was doing all those things just from making his bed. He was getting full dressed for work, going to his workstation in his house and being productive. And it reminded me of my time working with the military and um, they had master resilience training. And part of the components of resilience training for them was to hunt the good stuff. And what that means is instead of focusing on all the bad to focus on the good, the small, the good things and the good changes in you and around you and to stay focused on those. And I kind of want to share the six characteristics of military resilience because I think they can be useful for us to be more proactive versus reactive, not only in a global pandemic, but on a daily basis. And as I go through, the, through these, I just want you to think about like the stuff that we saw during the pandemic that people use to get through it and how these relate. So self-awareness, being aware of your strengths and your weaknesses and how you're doing mentally and physically, doing a self-check, reading self-help books, self-regulation, making positive changes both mentally and physically as needed, optimism, optimism, like staying positive and, and, and saying like, hey, we're going to make it through this and having self-love. Mental agility, learning new things. How many people picked up a, a new hobby during the pandemic? I heard of a lot of people who learned to play the guitar or learned how to cook. Strengths of character, growing as a person and finding pride in who you are and connection, having meaningful relationships. I think my favorite videos from the pandemic are the ones of people playing music on their balconies with each other or putting up the signs in the windows to support people, having a phone tree to check on their friends and see how they're doing. But we learned a lot of good things during the pandemic. And I think we need to continue to do those things because they can help us as we move forward. And Danielle, do you have anything to add when it comes to post-COVID life 
and tra transitioning with ease. I think there are a couple of important features of this. Um, you know, one is there's not the hard line coming out of lockdown that there was going into lockdown. You know, when, when quarantine happened, the world just changed overnight, but things are opening up at a different pace and we're coming back into life. Now it's important to note the pandemic isn't over yet, right? So this really is a transition period for all of us. And so I think, first of all, take it as a, at a pace that's comfortable for you. You know, maybe you're somebody who feels a little overwhelmed about just diving back into life and you just want to go into the shallow end and just kind of wait out on your own pace. That's fine. Maybe you are like, I'm out of the cage and I want to dive right in. I'm traveling the world. I'm going everywhere. I'm doing all the things. That's fine too. Both are correct. So I think, first of all, giving yourself space to take it at whatever pace feels comfortable and also allowing that to be really dynamic. So if you go out too far and you need to pull back, fine. You know, if you realize I need more, go do that. I think the other thing is also giving yourself a lot of space and gentleness over the fact that there's probably going to be some anxiety. You know, I hear this a lot and I think Kendall just spoke to this, but I hear this a lot in my patients and even in myself, I don't consider myself a socially anxious person and I consider I probably have some pretty top-notch coping skills. And I remember last Friday, my partner texted me and said, you know, we've got an event, bring your gift of gab. And it was my first post COVID event. And when he texted that, I had this moment of panic, you know, like, I don't know if I remember how to do that. And I had to sit myself down and say, Danielle, you're a therapist. You literally talk to people for a living. You know how to do this, but it's been so long and we're so out of practice and so rusty. You know, it's like, we've all forgotten how to do people things. So I think, again, it's just allowing it to be really dynamic and to take it at your own pace and just to accept that, yes, it's totally normal. Even your therapist feels anxious about this at times. So completely part of the process. Thanks, Danielle. Um, and Dr. Keith, I want to come to you now. Um, I want to come to you about your own mental health. And as a colleague of mine, I know you have experienced burnout prior to the pandemic and you're happy to share your story. So Firstly, would you be able to explain to us what exactly burnout is? Yeah, sure. Well, thanks, Tina. And yeah, very happy to share uh, about this. Um, yeah, it's burnout. I suppose that the easiest thing to do is to sort of start with a definition. And the, the definition of burnout is a state of emotional, physical or mental exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. Now, what is that? if not an exact description of what we've all just gone through. You know, it's been excessive and prolonged stress. We're all in a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion as a result of it. But, but when we're talking about burnout, we're talking about something a little bit more severe and a bit more specific, particularly to the workplace. Now, it's only really relatively recently been actually recognized as a medical diagnosis, and it comprises of three things, kind of three behaviors that happen. The first of which is that a person may feel exhausted, tired, or depleted, particularly that you're not getting very rested between these periods of work. You may feel mentally distanced from your job or negative or cynical uh, about the work that you do. And then at work, you may be of reduced effectiveness. You know, you're, you're less able to do your job on top of that. And the thing about burnout is that because it's prolonged stress, these things can build up gradually. It's a bit like the phrase is boiling a frog. Not that I'm recommending you do this, but, you know, a frog starts in the cold water and slowly the temperature heats up and it doesn't notice the change until it's too late. And that's exactly what happened to me as a general practitioner within the National Health Service, a general practitioner as a family practitioner in the US. And um, I was under a great deal of stress and it was unrelenting and it took some of my colleagues as well. They left. And what's typical there is that when one person goes, the pressure builds and it, it got built up and up. I started to find it difficult to let go of things. At the end of the day, I couldn't feel rested. I felt very cynical about things. I felt like I was still able to do my job, but I, I'd lost that kind of empathy with my patients. Um, and I just felt that I couldn't, I couldn't really get everything done. I was letting things go. And then what seemed very sudden in 2017 in summer, it was a very hot summer's day, is that all of a sudden, I just felt that I couldn't cope. Like All of a sudden, it hit me like this. But of course, I hadn't been coping for a long, long time. It's just at that point, my ability to soak up this had gone. And what I entered into was five months of really quite unpleasant times, so hellish times of depression and anxiety. And it took an awful lot of help from friends, from family, from my wife, from my general practitioner, medication, therapy, you name it. it took a lot of help to get me back to the point that I could return to work. And having gone through this, 
I first of all vowed that I would make the most of having got through this and make sure that I try and not go through it again and sort of save other people from going through it. Uh, and, and that's what I like to be able to do now and talk about it and share. Hopefully it helps some people in a similar situation. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And I know probably many people listening to you just now might be thinking they may have experienced burnout during the pandemic. Mm. Um, but what would you say the signs of burnout during lockdown are? And is there a difference between burnout during the pandemic and what was once our normal life? Yeah, uh, that, so so that's a that's a fair question to ask, and um, of course it's different, but it's also very similar. So so what are the differences? Well, the first is the differences in the cause. You know, uh, a person might have been stressed in their workplace beforehand, but then during the pandemic they're working from home. So some people might be working much harder than before, and I'm talking specifically about healthcare workers, key workers who are having to deal with their own very specific forms of stress as well in the environments they're working in. Or, or maybe you're not working in that sense, but you're at home and you're dealing with children that you're having to homeschool, caring for elderly and so on, and having to juggle everything and just survive in this unchanged world. But, but some of you might not be work, working at all. You might be furloughed and dealing with the stress and uncertainty of that. So the nature of the stress changes, but it remains persistent and unremitting. You have the uncertainty. You have this fear. You cannot ex you know, escape from the situation. You are literally asked to stay in your own home. So the, the nature of the stress you experience changes, but you also often don't have people around you to notice those changes. For me, it took a lot of people saying, Keith, you really aren't coping uh, for me to start taking the steps that I needed to. So those people are around you. You can't escape the surroundings and your work if you're working from home, can just bleed into the rest of the day. You get up early because you're not sleeping, you work. You work through to the end of the day. You're in the same room. You know, stress builds up. Uh, and as a result of that, you may get further into symptoms of depression with a persistent low mood, loss of hope, loss of enjoyment, or maybe even formal anxiety that you can't let things go, insomnia, worrying, checking behaviors. All these things can present in a different way. But the same result is the case. It's this inability to cope with cynicism about the world around you, uh, you know, and this sort of general lack of mental agility and wellness. And, and going back to your personal experience, what coping mechanisms have helped you to manage your mental health? And was there anything different that you did during the lockdown or the many lockdowns we've had that actually helped you? Sure. I think um, anyone who's experienced mental health issues, um, and has particularly tried to tough it out. You get to a point where you can't do that anymore. Depression certainly wasn't letting me just tough it out. And so I had to be quite humble in recognizing that I had to change some of my behaviors. I had to learn to talk a little bit more about how I was, you know, I, without me using the language of how I felt, I lost the ability to explain how I felt. Um, so talking is a very, very important thing. And that's something that I've brought through. So the things that I did, talking, setting boundaries, self-care and activity are all things that I've adapted. So the principles are the same. So there were fewer people immediately around to talk with, but I had more in-depth, regular conversations where I was at home with my wife. Um, I was able to sort of talk about that, made regular use of video chats, uh, but also, um, you know, was interested in my gaming. I'm a very keen online gamer and board gamer. I adapted that to stay in contact with people. And then with regards to boundaries, I'm fortunate to live in a place where I can set up my own little home office. But even then, my living and workspaces are very closely related. So I would try and keep them separate. And one thing that you can do, one thing that I did, is you, you basically keep that morning commute. Now, I'm not going to commute back up to London. But what I'll do is I'll get up, I'll prepare, I'll leave the house, I'll go out and get some activity, and then I'll come back and then I'll start the day. And I'll do the same at the end of the day as well. That makes a really, really good hard physical end and start to the day, which really helps. And then for... Self-care, it's presuming the things that I enjoy, forgiveness and gratitude, two really key activities that really help. Um, we're all going through some very strange things and learning to um, understand that and forgive others what seem like unusual behaviors or stress and strains can be really helpful and being grateful for the things that we have. Um, enjoying things, pursuing pleasure, but doing so in moderation, watch those things like eating, drinking, those kind of things you've got to watch out for. And then also moderate those activities that can make you unwell, that feel good at the time, like scratching an itch, but just drive you crazy. Things like checking social media, doom scrolling, watching the news. You know, I've had to advise some of my patients that sometimes you need to take some time completely away from the screen to allow you some downtime from this really attentive way of uh, Yeah, no, absolutely. So... As we all know, lockdown has been incredibly tough for all of us, but I thought we could focus on some of the positives of quarantine and the lessons that we've learned along the way. And Danielle, I'm going to come to you on this first. Um, what positives have you taken and how will you work this into your life moving forward? 
Yeah, I love this question. Um, you know, the pandemic um, was such a crazy time and and in some respects, it gave me more time to do things that I enjoy because I do have a lot of quiet hobbies. You know, I love to read and do jigsaw puzzles and be outside with my dog. So in that sense, it was just reminding myself how nice those are in my schedule. But I think more than that, I had a very like interesting pandemic experience because I had just moved to a new city three weeks before lockdown. And I basically knew like a couple of people and not well. <laughs> And, you know, lockdown occurs and all of a sudden you're very isolated and, and I'm somebody who enjoys solitude, but there's a difference between solitude and isolation. And there were at times this like visceral sense of loneliness. And so what it really forced me to do was to seek out community and connection where I was, you know, it forced me to prioritize my relations with my family and with my friends because those were very sustaining. But I also realized I needed community in the place where I was living. And some of that was a, was a practical aspect of what if I get sick or I have to go to the hospital and someone needs to care for my pet, you know? Um, so finding people to check in with, um, finding people to, you know, let's go socially distance on a hike with a mask on and just get out and have some, some social time. So, you know, for me, I know being a therapist, you talk all day long, you can get to the end of your day. You know, my mom calls and I'm like, I'll call her back tomorrow. Or my best friend texts and I'm like, I'll text you later. And it's easy to just let that stuff go by. But it really made me see, you know, when times are tough, those are the people that are going to sustain you having connection, having community, having close relationships. So, you know, now when my mom calls and it's eight at night and I'm exhausted, I take the call or I return the text, you know, I make the point to say, I'm going to cultivate the friends and family I have. And I'm also going to continue finding creative ways to connect like I did in the pandemic when I was joining Zooms or finding meetups or finding different ways to build those relationships around. That's great. And, and Kendall, what about you? Let's talk about your highs and some of your lows maybe during the pandemic and the biggest lessons you might have learned. And what would you hope that others can take away from this? Um, when I, when I talk to people about the pandemic, um, one thing always comes up and, you know, I was thinking about what, what Keith said and my, my bedroom, like I always tell people my bedroom is kind of like my apartment. Like it's, it was, it's a bedroom and there's a, there's a door that shuts off and it's like my bedroom and my bathroom all in one. And that is kind of where I lived. And, and I kind of likened it to sort of a jail cell at the time. It was like, my office, my gym, my bedroom, my bath, I mean, it was everything, that, that whole room, because I had to shut off from my children to be able to work. And it was the only place really that I could set up my home gym as well. And, um, you know, what happened for all of us is when we got quarantined, we were in these four walls of our homes and the inner demons, the things that we were pushing down and we were avoiding, we had no distractions to, to stop us from thinking about those things. So there was, there was nothing that could happen but for them to come out and for us to actually deal with them. We were for, forced to deal with the things that we were avoiding. Um, and one thing that I always do when I'm struggling is I write. And during this time, I, I wrote like a little poem, which will kind of tell you like where I was at. Um, it's more like a stanza, but um, it's in the closet of my mind. These four walls do confine. I try to think of something else, but all I can think of is myself. And I really think that one positive thing that we can take away from this pandemic is that it has increased mental health care and access to mental health care because everyone was forced to deal with those things that they were pushing down. And one thing that I would like to see us take from this and to change is to not wait until we're sick, to not wait until we're overwhelmed, to get health care, to get mental health care, or to get healthy, to exercise, to eat right. Um, I would rather we were more proactive versus reactive so we can be prepared for things that come our way in the future. I love the fact you wrote that poem. and I really think you need to get that published. It's really <laughs> Love it so much. Um, and Dr. Keith, when it comes to the future and moving on with our new normal, how can we continue to keep well in a changed world? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I'd really sort of split it into two areas. There's those things that I do personally, which will I undoubtedly bring into my professional work and then and then more sort of dispassionately what I, what I would do professionally. The things the things that I realized in the last year is um, uh, enjoying the small things when you have everything else taken away and you're told to stay at home 
um, all of a sudden, the, the things that you really miss become apparent. And the things that I was really missing uh, were something simple, like going outside and walking. There were times when you weren't even allowed really to go outside at all. So learning to enjoy those things. And then when I got out to do them, and they were transformed, you know, like to be outside, and it was silent. There was no cars. There were no planes. There was nothing. I could hear the birds. I could hear everything. You know, I was walking right down the fairway of the nearest golf course, not having to worry about a golf ball hitting me in the face. I was able to walk right down the main streets because they were all shut. You know, these are things that I don't think I'll ever really get a chance to do again. So that was nice, but also realizing that there was something that came from this that I'm not going to get. And so one of the things I'm fond of saying to people now as we approach the end of lockdown in some areas is that what are the things that you don't have a chance to do again? If lockdown never comes back, and hopefully it won't, you know, what what are you going to miss? What What's that thing? And there'll be some things that you haven't done. And you'll, you'll realize this afterwards. And I think that sort of changes a little bit. I, you know, there are hard times as well, no doubt. But there are some positives in there. And I try and dwell on that. I think the other thing as well is this kindness to other people as well. Um, when, at the start, we we contacted our neighbors. And uh, for some of them quite elderly, we had to sort of set up shopping and so on. And um, I mean, these are really, really silly little things, really, but it's so important. And it added routine. And we made friends with our neighbors in a way that we hadn't before. And caring for others is so powerful at giving purpose at times like this I you know it, it's something that I'm going to remember for a long time uh, I suppose the other thing as well is that I started cold water swimming on January the 1st when the temperature was like five degrees centigrade so after I finish this today I'm going out into the sea and I'm going to swim and that is something that I'm going to continually do um, and then just briefly in terms of the professional side of things I'll tell everyone about that of course but but the other things there are two things first of all I am delighted the world now realizes how effective telehealth is. I have spent my career trying to convince people that it is not only safe, but very helpful to be able to speak to people remotely or by video or by WhatsApp message. And now, because we had to, a lot of the barriers have gone. So the, you know, the discussion that we heard earlier on about trying to maintain in the States, the reimbursement and so on like that, I think is absolutely crucial because for some people, uh, telehealth is the difference between some care and no care at all. And also, I suppose, underlining it all, it's this integrated care. You know, we've got uh, a conversation here between, uh, you know, people working in behavioral health, me as a clinician, and uh, everyone else working in the sort of structure of Babylon. This sort of integrated approach, bringing all these different things in and sort of caring for the totality of the patient, I think is something that's been really reinforced this year and something that I'm definitely going to continue and continue with my colleagues here at Babylon. That's amazing. Thanks, Keith, for that. So that wraps up with the questions that I had for you guys, but I believe we've got a few questions come in from our Slido page that was up earlier. And by all means, feel free, if, you, if anyone has any questions, just scan the QR code and fire away. So let's start with the top one. And I don't mind who wants to take this, just whoever wants to jump in. Um, I don't want things to go back to normal. How can I stop resisting? Who would like to take that one for me? I'll take that one. You know, I think if you look back and somebody had said to you in 2019, the world is going to change dramatically in 2020 and just kind of explain to you the craziness that was about to unfold and said, you're ready for that, right? I don't think any of us would have said, yeah, absolutely. I have my pandemic field manual. I've been waiting for this. I've been prepping for the zombie apocalypse. I've got it all together. I'm ready to go now. We would not have said we were ready to deal with this, but we did right? Because what was our other option? We had to learn to adapt. And so when you think about, I don't want things to go back to normal, I, you probably weren't ready for things to change, but you managed that. So there's no reason to think you can't manage this with the right tools. Now, if you really find that you're just overwhelmed with anxiety, that's a great time to seek some professional help. You know, it's more accessible and available than ever. So work with a therapist to help you work through those thought patterns and to figure out what about you is so resistant. But at the end of the day, I would just remind yourself you weren't ready for it to change and you manage that and you'll manage this just fine as well. We're very adaptable. Yeah, I love that. Um, next question. I feel like I've changed a lot in the last year. Are there any tips for avoiding old patterns and showing up in a way that's authentic to the new person I've become? Who would like to take that? I can take that one. I, I think that's something that like I've really been focused on in this past year. And, and I love that word, like authenticity, like being an authentic person. Um, 
I think a lot of people have changed during this. A lot of a lot of my patients have said I've I've completely changed. I'm not the same person. And even to the point of like I don't think I want to be friends with some of the people I used to be friends with. And I think if this is the case, you have to be honest. It's always best to be honest and to have conversations with your friends and your family and and tell them what you've done. Tell them, you know, the changes and how you feel and um if, if they're truly your friends, they're going to respect that and honor that. And if you're having to let go of some friends, that's, that's a whole nother ball game. Um, and I think sometimes it's best just to set boundaries, to set really healthy boundaries for yourself. And for you, just be true to yourself because if you go back to your old habits, you're going to be disappointed and um, you'll have to start all over again, all that self-work that you've done during the pandemic. But if you do, also give yourself grace because um, we sometimes fall off the wagon and we have to have a redo, and that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was I was maybe just going to follow up on that as well, uh, and actually, Kendall came straight to it as well, so that's great. It's that sort of you, you know you want to be kind to others because you know you're feeling this. There's no reason to suggest that the person you're speaking with or seeing may feel the same way themselves. Um, so you know, being kind to others is important, but equally be kind to yourself. Um, this is, you know, going back to normality is a time that you're meant to be totally delighted. But for some of us, there'll be bits that, you know, you'd be very happy that they managed to keep on. You know, some people enjoyed their own company over this time. So be kind to yourself as well. You know, this isn't a competition. You don't have to achieve more than the next person. Uh, and you may do well one day and then do badly the next. This is, you know, we're all human and we're dealing with, I mean, again, I'll say it out loud. We're dealing with a global pandemic <laughs> that previously was in movies and board games, and we've lived through it, you know, and it's still going on. So it's okay to feel a little bit overwhelmed by this, but, you know, step by step, be kind to yourself, be kind to others. No, absolutely. Thank you, guys. So tips for dealing with anxiety as a lot of my friends have moved away and I feel even more alone post lockdown. Anyone would like to? Yeah. So I don't, I don't think I was alone in realizing the of social connection during the pandemic. And I think that, you know, my general, my general approach to therapy is change what you can learn to feel better about the rest. And being alone is something you can change if you can work through the anxiety to put yourself out there a little bit. You know, I think everybody's craving social connection now. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for that. So I think a lot of that's just making yourself available to it. And it can even be small things, you know, like, um, a few weeks ago, I was alone on a Saturday night and I knocked on my neighbor's door and said, hey, I have extra food. You want to come share dinner with me? You know, or when I see my downstairs neighbors at the pool, it's like, let's chat and just get to know each other and maybe have a barbecue. Just making conversation with people around you. Find a meetup group. Find people that are doing the things you like to do and join in with them. You know, every most people are ready for social connection or at least have some appetite for that at this point and there are so many different opportunities so i think it's just opening your mind to being able to put yourself out there and, and avail yourself of those yeah i love that idea i wish my neighbor would knock on my door and give me food um, I'm not a great <laughs> uh, so what are the physiological effects of anxiety and stress and what chemicals is the body brain producing example increase adrenaline and can these be tracked i don't know who would like to take that question um i i, I can come in uh, just with some of these as well i mean the the physiology of anxiety and stress and the the neurochemistry and the body chemistry can be can be complex but it comes down in essence to um what's often described as fight or flight uh, i've actually heard a greater version of that recently which is fight flight freeze or fawn uh, which was a brilliant way of describing it. Fight, you know, if you think about in a more simple world where there's, a, you know, we have to prepare ourselves when something stressful happens, you know, it's the caveman and the saber-toothed tiger, um, and they come across, you know, you, you, you drop a lot of these chemicals, this adrenaline, your sort of sympathetic nervous system cues up because you're ready to either get involved in a fight or, or, or leg it, run away, you know, so fight or flight, or freeze, you feel like paralyzed, you sort of stay still to avoid the attention of the saber-toothed tiger. Um, but the other one I heard recently was fawn, which is you try and entertain the tiger. You try and distract it from wanting to eat you as well. That was used in a description as to why performers sometimes do what they do. Um, so there's all these different behaviors that you do to try and deal with the stress. 
and in you know when you're fighting a saber-toothed tiger that can be really really helpful but of course we're not in that at the moment in fact some of us are still locked inside our houses as well so the physiological effects that sort of increased muscle tension that increased heart rate the increased blood pressure breathing faster to get yourself ready to do all these things or lock still those cause very sort of significant physical symptoms and the chemistry inside the body like i said can be quite complex and can be tracked but it's difficult to track in a way um, that allows you to use a sensor or something. Although there are people working on this. One of the things that probably does have some value is heart rate variability. Um, the body has uh, a kind of uh, automatic nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. And uh, one, of the, one of the nerves that's involved in this is something called the vagus nerve, and that can affect the rate of the heart. So the heart rate will go up and down. You can check the variability of that, and that gives you an indication of that state of kind of arousal, whether you're sort of wound up or not. And so there's a number of devices that do that. Your Apple Watch will track your heart rate variability. And so there's some interesting stuff to be done in there. But um, there's probably nothing that's quite as simple as saying you're stressed or not beyond actually spending time to learn to recognize the sig signals yourself and listen when someone tells you. That's so interesting. Thanks, Keith. So how can I set boundaries with friends and family that expect me to be available all of the time now? I can speak to that. Um, so one thing that I like to say when dealing with setting boundaries is setting boundaries is like um, having a gate to your yard. And that gate is a gate that only you can open up to other people. Nobody else can open that gate from the outside in. You decide who I'm going to open the gate up to, when and how. And nobody can tell you, something that Danielle said that I, I really liked, and I'm gonna use this as an example, like nobody can tell you how quickly to get into the water. So as you go back into social situations, if you're feeling uncomfortable with taking the bus or you're feeling uncomfortable with being around family um, or going out with friends, you need to get into the water at your pace. So if that means that you're gonna gradually walk into the water a little bit at a time and slowly warm up to it, then that's okay. You're the only one who can say what's okay for you. So set those boundaries, be firm in them. And like I said before, explain to them what's going on for you, how you feel. And if they truly love and care about you, they're going to understand and respect that. Yeah, boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. Um, thank you. So any tips not feeling overwhelmed as my social calendar begins to fill up? Yeah, I think that um, I think there's a couple pieces to this. I think one is just um, that self-regulation piece that Kendall mentioned earlier of checking in with yourself and monitoring your own anxiety and stress level. And if it's starting to get off the charts, then, you know, looking at your social calendar and saying, do I need to pull back? And, you know, this also goes to the boundary issue of, you know, maybe I'm overwhelmed because I'm not setting the boundaries I need to, and I'm not giving myself permission to say no. So I think that, you know, it's, it's reminding ourselves, we get to set our own permissions and to not feel bad about that. Yeah, absolutely. How do I manage my mental health if I feel I am making progress, but my partner is stuck and does not see the need to gather their mental health? would love to get that one for me. I can, I can talk to that. Um, so this happens a lot in relationships um, in, in different ways, not just in progress in your mental health. And I think it's important, like I talked about earlier, to recognize that everybody's going to move at their own pace. And you may be moving forward and your partner may not be, they may not be ready or they may not be able to deal with what's going on in their mental health because it might be overwhelming to them on top of everything else that's going on in their life. So this isn't a time for them to try to address what's going on because it might push them over the top. So just really try to be aware that everybody needs to go at their own pace. Now, a, a different side of that is if you feel like that's holding you back and you're not able to move forward because they're keeping you back and stopping you from being able to make the progress that you need to make, then I think that's a different thing that you have to kind of think about and figure out what you want to do. Do you want to kind of stay with them and help them progress at their, at their own pace? Or uh, do you need to move forward on your own because it's holding you back? 
And if that's what's going on, I would suggest that you talk with a mental health professional and, and have them help you kind of walk through that journey and that path with you. Thank you, Kendall, for that. Um, when good things happened, I felt guilty later and I found it hard to embrace the good. How do I accept the good and not be suspicious when something good happens? So this is an interesting question um, because I'm kind of hearing two different things. Um, I'm feeling guilty about the good, but I'm also feeling suspicious about the good. And I think if you're saying, I feel guilty, then I think it's reminding yourself that, you know, guilt is a powerful emotion that's used to basically keep us civil and in good working order as a society, but it can often be misplaced. So it's reminding yourself, hey, I'm not actually doing anything wrong by enjoying the good things of my life. Now, if you're saying I'm suspicious because I'm having trust issues, that the good is going to continue, then that sounds like it's more of an issue of Am I able to manage my mind around things changing? Am I able to be okay if things don't continue on this path? And that sounds like, you know, a great place to work in therapy to do some of that thought work and figure out what is it that I feel like I'm unable to cope with if this good thing doesn't continue on. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I'm really sorry to hear for the next question. We lost my mum-in-law and father-in-law during this time and we really weren't able to say goodbye. No funeral. So how do we adjust the reality of what happened? Who would like to take that? Anyone? I mean, I, I'll, I, I mean, I'll step in and first of all say, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear this. It's, um, you know, it's difficult to say first of all anything more than that it's absolutely terrible thing for this to have happened and then to have all the all those ceremonies that we've put into place um because we have as a as a human race evolved these things that we do to sort of it's like celebrate and share and commiserate and you know care for each other and that has stopped as well and so that that makes things particularly hard uh, i've seen this with some of my patients as well and um i think the first thing first thing to say is that uh, as with all all grief and bereavement, everything everyone has their own particular path to walk on this one, and I think um, this is a new place for people to to be experiencing. There's a sort of slight variation on this as well, but will be shared in common with others. Um, what I'd probably do if I was, you know, as as a general practitioner, as a human being speaking to another human being here as well, I'd want to listen to a person, so sort of truly express how they feel about this and help them sort of understand what next steps to take and but just in terms of services that are available I can speak a little bit to the United Kingdom that there's a, a service called Cruise C-R-U-S-E in the UK uh, that provides services for people um, that find it difficult to deal with uh, grief and bereavement issues as well that, um, that are sometimes worth accessing and I'm not sure whether there's anything similar in the US, I know we've got some US audience members here as well. So I don't know whether Kendall or Danielle know about anything similar there. But again, before I hand over, I'm, I'm so terribly sorry to hear this. It's, it's something that, that you know, you're not alone in this. There's many people that have lost folk, but that does not in any way diminish how horrible it's been for you. So Keith, I don't know if we have anything like that, um, but I know that there are a lot of like grief groups. Um, and one thing I love about, you know, talking about uh, telemedicine right now, there's also a lot of groups that you can join online right now, even um, the codependent anonymous groups and, and different uh, bereavement groups and stuff like that are, are online, which is great for you to access right now because you don't have to go anywhere. You can do it from the comfort of your own home. But I have worked a lot with grief and some things that I would say to you to just try to kind of help you through this is um, to look up the steps of grief and, um, and take a look at, at all of those different things that you're going to go through. But to know, too, that you're not going to go through those cookie cutter. Everybody goes through them differently. So you're going to go up and you're going to go down. And I always kind of liken that to rock climbing. Um, sometimes when you start to rock climb, you think, oh, this is a good step that I can take. And then you start to go there and you can't reach it. And you're like, nope. I, and you have to go down to get back up and find a different path. So you're going to go up and you're going to go down. But eventually you're going to make it to the top, which is acceptance. And um and, it, and it's just, it's not, it's still going to hurt. You're going to still miss those people, but you're going to come to the reality of like, they're gone. We've lost them. And this is the new reality. This is what life is like now. Um, and, and come to terms with it and how to deal with it. Um, I think too, some things that I would say that have helped past clients of mine 
is, you know, one of the things that we typically do to grieve is to have this memorial that you didn't get to have. And during that memorial, what happens is typically people sit around and they, they tell stories about the people that they've lost and, and they talk about all the good memories. And it's just part of that like healing process to really remember and think about them. So I have suggested that clients put together like a memory book and not only just to do pictures, but to get people to write stories, their favorite stories of the person and to add those into the book. Because then as you go down the road, you don't forget those things. You can look back and you can read them. And also if you have kids that you want to know them, even though they're not going to physically be around them, they can look at it and they can have some knowledge about this person who's passed and who they were and the things that they did in their life. So I would suggest that. And then keep, um, some memorial times, like set up some times that are special to you, if it was their birthday or if it was a holiday. Um, and when that holiday or that birthday comes around to do something in memory of that person that was special to them. So I've had um, patients who've gone bowling because the person they lost loved to bowl on that memorial day, or um, they go out to the person's favorite restaurant and they put a balloon on the chair to remember them. But those are things that just kind of help you on those days, make it not so difficult, but make it more a celebration of their life. I love the memory book idea. It's so it's really nice. Thank you, Kendall. And I've just seen as well, Keith um, put the link to, is it Cruise um, in the chat if anyone wants to access that from the UK. Um, how can I encourage friends who are struggling to get help? Who would like to take this one? Yeah, so I think this is similar to what Kendall said when you have a partner who is maybe stuck and, you know, everybody, everybody is ready when they're ready. Um, it's funny because people ask me, how do you know when somebody's ready for therapy? And I'll say it's the easiest thing to know in the world. It's just who does the work, you know, and if you're just not ready for that and you show up and you have homework, or you have whatever it is, and you're just consistently saying, I don't know how to do this. Like you just may not be there yet. So I think it's just continuing to be um, supportive, encouraging, but also to remember like it takes what it takes and it takes the time it takes for people to be ready to make change. I mean, change is hard under the best of circumstances. Even when you're desperate to change, it's still really hard and it's a lot of consistent effort. So if you're not ready, it's, you know, an inhuman task to be able to do. So it's just continuing to be supportive and knowing it takes the time that it does and the events that it does for that to transpire. Amazing. Thanks, Danielle. I think we've come to the end of our questions now. Um, so I'd just like to thank everybody who's joined today and also thank you to our panelists who've been fantastic and it's been really insightful to listen to you. So thank you. For those of you who do have any further questions or who would like to see the recording of this, you can always email events at babylonhealth.com. We'd be happy to send the link to you. But for now, thanks to everybody and thank you to our panelists once again. Hope to see you guys soon. Bye.